Anyone know how to watch the block in the States? You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and as always you can find me on Twitter at RedRock underscore Beeble. I'm back with another of the season preview podcasts and today we're going to be looking at the San Antonio Spurs. And to discuss the San Antonio Spurs, I am joined by the host of the Locked On Spurs podcast, Jeff Garcia. Welcome Jeff. Hey Josh, how's it going? It's uh, it's it's going well. It's good to have you back on. We uh, spoke to you last year on the, on this show, and I've been on your podcast a couple of times. So it's good to have you back on to talk all things Spurs and a, a slightly new look Spurs team, I guess this season. You got that right. It's uh, almost a, a completely new, revamped roster. Something new, something old. But I'm looking forward to exactly what Popovich and the rest of the coaching staff has uh, set for the Spurs and the new season, which is about to tip off. In a few short weeks, yeah, we're like six six weeks away, I think, from uh, from opening up, maybe, yeah. maybe maybe seven, we're getting getting close to that sort of a uh, time frame. Um, so we're we're really going to have these questions answered pretty soon. But I've got the questions for you now, for you to try and pontificate on what might actually happen. And what we're doing in these shows, Jeff, is is looking at the uh, the players, starting off by looking at the players who arrived uh, at the team, new players for this season, and how they're going to fit in. And the biggest name that arrived for the Spurs is the addition of Rudy Gay coming off that Achilles tear that he suffered midway through last season. Um, we know what Rudy Gay used to be, but at 30 years of age, Coming off an Achilles tear, he joins this San Antonio Spurs team. Now, what sort of role are we anticipating for Gay this season? Because he's not going to be starting. Yeah, I look at uh, Rudy coming off that bench and uh, doing well with the Spurs in the Spurs, and more, more specifically Popovich, um, guiding him in his recovery back to the court. If you look at uh, a lot of the videos that he has posted of his recovery since the injury, I, he looks like he's on a mission. He looks like he's a beast, but there's a difference between getting ready, your body ready, and your Achilles heel healed up 100%. And then, of course, there's real game, live uh, feel, be on the court, test that Achilles heel. We'll, we'll expect Popovich to watch him, watch his minutes, maybe uh, still test him. The Spurs are very overcautious when it comes to injuries to their players. I recall a few years ago when Boris Dia was on the team and he tweaked his ankle or leg uh, years ago playing for Team France. And whew, Popovich and the coaching staff, they sent out doctors over there and they sat him out longer than what Team France wanted to. So managed minutes um, will be uh, on the menu for Rudy Gay. But eventually they'll get ratcheted up He'll get more minutes on the court and uh, be the player that everybody uh, who cheers for the silver and black hopes he can be that we saw before the injury in Sacramento. And of course, this is Memphis days. Uh, he will be spotting Kawhi Leonard. And that is a nice one, two combo for the Spurs to have. You have a guy like Kawhi Leonard, who's an MVP candidate. And I don't think we need to dive into exactly what he brings to the court, but Rudy Gay also similarly brings almost the same type of offense and defense if he's healthy. Now, granted, he's not on the level of Kawhi Leonard, but he is one of the uh, underrated uh, offensive players throughout his career. Always felt that he should have been recognized for a lot more what he can do on that end of the court. And, of course, defensively, he plays well. During his heyday with Memphis and when uh, young Kawhi Leonard was still learning um, the ways of the NBA, really good. He took it to him, and there's video out there. You can go look at Rudy Gay just simply dominating a young Kawhi Leonard. And that was then. This is now. Kawhi has matured, and probably a whole story, but a different story, I'm sorry. However, I like this. I think the Spurs got themselves a, a great deal financially. I mean, Rudy Gay came on the cheap. He's looking uh, as this coming season as a way to get back to what he was before at the all-star level. And he's willing to start well, practically almost all over again um, and prove himself. This is pretty much a contract year, if you really think about it, for him. 
Uh, he signed uh, on a one-year deal, I believe. And he has to prove himself, and he's willing and able, and he's up for the challenge. And I think Spurs fans, the coaching staff, the rest of the NBA, the loaded West are going to take notice of exactly that Rudy Gay is back. But don't expect that right out the gate. Expect the Spurs to still be overly cautious with Rudy as he begins his new season in a new team and hopefully 100% Achilles heel that is ready to go. Now, a couple of things. Um, he's got he's got a player option for next year, so essentially, yeah, it, it is it is a one year mm-hmm. deal. Now you're 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 um a Spurs guy. You're you're watching the Spurs. You're talking about the Spurs. So you're, you're optimistic. I'm gonna I'm gonna pour some uh, cold water on that because players that come back at the age of thirty, especially from an Achilles injury, they never come back the same. It, it, exactly, it, it just never happens. Brandon Jennings came back from an Achilles. He's playing in China now. Like he can't he can't cut it in the NBA. And Brandon Jennings mm-hmm. was probably never the level of player that Rudy Gay was. And Gay has always been underrated, especially in fantasy. He was just a consistent top 50 guy who'd score, he'd rebound, he'd pass, he'd get steals, he'd block shots, he would do everything and was a rotisserie league you know, star that you could always get late. The problem is, at the age of 30, he's going to be really limited early. He's going to miss some games, he's going to sit out rest days, he's going to have limited minutes. And the other thing is, is he's, even if he comes back 100% and miraculously you know, just destroying all scientific evidence of recoveries from Achilles <laughs> tendon injuries, his cap on what he can do is limited because he's got Kawhi Leonard ahead of him. And if right. he's going to play the four, he's got LaMarcus Aldridge ahead of him. So he can't just say, well, you know what, guys, I'm fully ready to go. Let's go 35 minutes a night because they're, they're just not there. Those minutes just aren't there for him to do that uh, every night. So he's he's going to be limited in that sense. Now, he's getting drafted at about pick 80 in ESPN and Yahoo leagues. And there's no way that I want anything to do with him at that point. It's too early for a guy that's going to struggle early on. He's going to he might take three months to actually get his groove back. I think his percentages will fall off a little bit. And the playing time upside just isn't there for Gay. Now, I'd really like him. He is a he is a good good player and he has been a good player, but there's absolutely nothing in NBA history. It really tells us that he's going to be able to bounce back to being at the same level. And even if he does, his minutes and his ability to play that same role in Sacramento, it just isn't there in this team, unless the unfortunate happens and Kawhi goes down and Zaza Pachulia makes another appearance and does something. But <laughs> otherwise, he's just he's going to be a, a really solid backup that plays. He, he might play close to 30 a night. He might play 28 a night. He might play 27 when everything's said and done by the time we hit December, January. That might be what he does, but he's not playing 34. He's not playing 33, and he's not going to be the same player. I don't believe that what he was. So I think that's a, a wasted pick if anyone's picking him there at pick 80. But in terms of what they got him for, to be a backup, it is absolutely fantastic for this team. If he can produce even 70% of what he was in Sacramento, it is a great deal for San Antonio. But it's not a great deal for fantasy people to be picking him at that spot. The other guys, Jeff, that they added, there's very little excitement, I believe, with these guys. Joffrey Laverne, who was horrendous right. in Chicago, didn't do much in OKC, <laughs> didn't do much in Denver. He comes in and ostensibly replaces Dwayne Dedman and David Lee at this point, which to me, mm-hmm. it's not great. And I would think that he will be behind a guy like Davis Bertans who will play a much larger role this season. Is that how you see it with Laverne? And how, how do you see him fitting? Because I, I just can't see him being a, an every night piece of the rotation. No, I don't either. I, I think if anything, he is uh, six fouls. He is yeah. uh, somebody they can throw a body at, like a, a, a Jaja or um, uh, a Millsap, who's now in the uh, West. Uh, just just somebody that can clog the paint and get some rebounds and uh, do a lot of the dirty work. Uh, something you saw that from David Lee uh, last season with San Antonio. Look, he is... He's not a stretch four. He he can't break um, open the paint with his uh, hot shooting from long range. You know he's. I mean I'm gonna I'm gonna put on my Spurs uh, colored glasses right now and say that if anything if anything that could make him flourish in this system is that it is the Spurs system, a system that Team France uses and openly admits that they copy. Uh, so he has an idea of what the Spurs are run. He's friends with Tony Parker. He's friends with Boris Diaw. He's he's playing right now with Nando DiColo. You, I cannot, for the life of me, be thinking that he is not asking those guys, maybe not Parker because he's not with the team, but a Diaw or a DiColo, hey, what's it like to play in San Antonio? You know, Parker, I'm pretty sure he's spoken to him. So I think he has a, a little bit of a learning curve edge, and it's going to be quicker for him. Uh, but at the end of the day, He's just a role player, and his role player is going to be disrupt uh, would-be uh, penetrators to the rim, um, throw a body on somebody, get some rebounds, and if he can knock down the occasional mid-range shot, which he can do, 
then great. That'd be awesome. But do not expect um, some crazy um, rebounding numbers left and right or, or block shots. Um, no, he's not blocking any shots. Yeah, he ain't blocking any shots or anything. He's just doing the dirty work that the Spurs need. And let's face it, you look, you you lose a Dwayne Deadman, who was an athletic freak. Um, David Lee, I opted out. He's looking for a better deal, yet hasn't found anything as we speak and record this show. So the Spurs had to dig deep. And why not go with somebody? And again, I'm putting my Spurs colored glasses on right now. Go with somebody who has some sort of international tie to the team. Um, you know, that, that's what I'm, that's like the, the silver lining in all this, I, I, I believe. And uh, yeah, look, if anybody can pull a, a gem deep in the barrel, it could be Popovich and he, you know, Joffrey could explode and maybe up his, maybe his defensive numbers, like the Spurs preach defense. I think Popovich and the coaching staff will get a little bit more out of him on that end. But offensively, no, I mean, he cannot do, do what a Bertans could potentially do once he gets more minutes next season uh, or a LaMarcus Aldridge or a Pau Gasol. So, yeah, I mean, expect Joffrey Laverne simply to be a, a dirty work kind of guy and uh, do the little things that the Spurs need to get that get get a win or get a series win, getting a key rebound, um, tip, tipping it out to the guards, setting a good solid pick. You, you know, maybe kind of also being a little bit of the enforcer type um, player that the Spurs need. He's also got a pretty sexy beard, so that's 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 one positive that, uh, <laughs> that Joffrey Laverne has. The other thing I, I don't know. You you got you got some competition there. Uh, I, I know. Josh, I know he, uh, he he looks he looks pretty good. He looks he looks pretty uh looks pretty. And uh, he's a kickboxer. There. Did you know that? No, I, that's, wow. No, I didn't know that. Now that that's definitely yeah. so. So we can see James Johnson versus Joffrey Laverne in like a in some sort of martial arts battle. That would be <laughs> or Tim Duncan. Oh, Tim Tim Duncan as well. That'd be interesting. I think that the the moves that they've made with Lee and Deadman going and and Laverne mm -hmm. coming in, I think it's going to mean we see more Lamarcus Aldridge at center. Now I know he's too precious to play center. He doesn't want to do it, but. I think he's going to have to. I think he's going to have to play more minutes at center this season. And we see Leonard Gay Aldridge lineups uh, at times this year. And Popovich has been a little bit hesitant to do that. But I think that with the personnel that's on this team, you'll see a little bit more uh, of that from the Spurs this season. We'll talk mm. about that a little bit more later. The other two guys they brought in, Brandon Paul and then Matt Costello on a two-way deal. Um, Brandon Paul's a, a shooting guard. Costello's a big I don't think there's going to be much to see with those guys. They'll spend majority of their time uh, in, in the G League, obviously, with Costello on a two-way deal. He'll have to spend the majority right. of his time in the G League. And Paul's a guy that's, uh, that, that is a bit of a gunner, but yeah, I don't, I don't think we're seeing a huge amount out of him. But we've seen no. undrafted players um, on the Spurs develop into something. Jonathan Simmons, the latest Gary ones. Gary Neal. Yeah. Gary Neal, another one. One of these guys yep. who can play the guard position and Popovich can develop. So he's a name to watch just because of the, uh, the Popovich... Um, I guess, track record of developing these guys. We've already talked about some of the guys that have left this team. Deadman to the Hawks, Lee unsigned, Joel Anthony's gone, and John Simmons has gone to the Magic. And in the draft, they brought in with the 28th pick, Derek White, the point guard out of Colorado, who had a couple of decent moments in Summer League, but I thought overall struggled. He's got some decent size to him, mm -hmm. but he's just going to be sitting in that developmental role at the, at oh, the yeah. moment as the third point guard, and then later in the season as the... Uh, as the fourth point guard, but do you think that he has any sort of shot, um, I guess, in the future of becoming uh, a key rotational piece, or you just haven't been that impressed with what you've seen? Um, the, the jury is still out for me. I I need to see more of him, and yes, he did show uh, great flashes uh, in the uh, summer league out in Vegas, and I like what I saw, but his learning curve is still needing to get on his learning curve. You know, he still needs to jump on that. You look at him, and yeah, I think what's going to stunt his development is the fact that he's going to be playing behind a Patty Mills, a DeJounte Murray, uh, you know, Parker once he comes back. If anything, you look at Dirk White, and the Spurs are just looking for insurance, just insurance in case Parker is a little worse for wear and he doesn't come back in, in January. Or maybe uh, DeJounte Murray just can't handle the um, role of the starting point guard, presumably that he's going to get the nod. And, of course, Patty Mills, that's not really his position. He is off-the-bench guy. He likes to shoot and create offense. Um, he can facilitate, but he's not known for being a facilitator. And then you also look at um, 
just the Spurs in general, and the, the, the especially Popovich, you know, he has a short leash on uh, rookies, and he is likely to send Derek White and Blossom game. I know you're gonna mention him in a bit uh, to uh, the G League, and so expect expect that Austin team to have a phenomenal squad. But at the end of the day, uh, Derek White is just playing behind some better players right now, and. You, you you also look at the fact they brought in uh, recently in London uh, Perantes, uh from the uh, summer league. He was playing with the Miami Heat team, another guard. So it looks like they the Spurs are really focusing on the point guard position right now. I think they're trying to up the competition in training camp and in the preseason to push a guy like Murray. Uh, these are guys that are hungry. Derek White, uh, Perantes, uh, yeah, Brandon Paul. You know these guards. Uh, they're going to come at Murray, and Murray is he's going to be another microscope uh, this coming season. So yeah, I think Derek White has good upside, but that upside needs to show off more against some increased competition. And you're going to see that in the G League and in the preseason, maybe the occasional call-up game against a low team on the totem pole in the NBA and uh, to show exactly what he can do against real NBA competition. But as of right now, I think the jury is still out. He's a guy that does have good fantasy statistical translations, mm-hmm. like he can get steals, he, his assists, his rebounds, all that sort of stuff's nice. So it'd be interesting to see how he uh, he does actually develop. And you, you touched on Jerome Blossom game, who was a second round pick. Now, I don't believe that he is signed as of yet. Um, the Spurs do have 15 guys signed plus the one two-way. So there is a two-way spot available for Blossom well, game. Well, they did. They the, at the end of the day, the news is that the, the, he signed a a G League contract. There's no two way. There's no Spurs okay, contract. So he's just going to be with signed Austin. with the Austin team. Yep, yeah, he's okay. going to just be with Austin. Yeah, so he won't. So he'll. He, they'll have to create an open roster spot for him this season if they are going to bring him up at any stage. But he he will be playing there. They'll still have his his draft rights. Um, one thing you mentioned about uh, the point guards, and I'll talk about a little bit that in a bit more. But in terms of yeah, you know, Paddy Mills not being really a distributor. What we saw last season when Parker went down is that some of that ball distribution role. It went into Kawhi Leonard's hands. So we know who Kawhi Mm -hmm. is. We know how good he is defensively. We know the sort of numbers he puts up. To me, he is the clear um, number eight player for fantasy this year. I'm pretty like locked in that he is just number eight. And that's where you grab him. But I think that if we're looking at upside, yeah, look, he could increase his scoring. He could increase, he can get his steal numbers back up because they've dipped Mm -hmm. a little bit lately. His efficiency could go back up. But I think that there is definitely room for Kawhi to increase his assist numbers this year as we saw him handling and initiating stuff a lot more last season. And if Murray's not cutting it, and you would think that Kawhi would get preference there anyway, and Mills, that's not his role with Tony Parker out, that Kawhi could actually become more of a ball handler and get his assist numbers up to career high levels this, this season. And that's exactly what I think that Kawhi is going to do to improve on his game is that becoming a facilitator. And now look, Mata Ginobili came back. So, uh, you know, he, he often throughout his career yeah, has be also been guard. a de facto yeah. a point guard. So expect that as well. But as far as Kawhi and his distribution, yeah, that is the next step in his evolution. I think, look, teams are going to be keying off him ever some more often now, especially considering the MVP season he had uh, last year. They're going to be double teaming him. They're going to be triple teaming him. He's going to have to figure out a way to perhaps break that double, triple team down by, again, getting the ball out of his hands, facilitating, driving, looking for the open man, kicking it out, um, setting good picks and getting the pass off the pick and roll, then finding somebody who's open. Yeah, I think that's exactly his next level in his uh, development and didn't to think that each season since he's been in the NBA, he's increased his offensive increase. I expect this season to actually see it either stay the same or maybe dip a bit simply because teams are going to be looking at him. Now they're going to be looking at him as the head of the snake and let's cut that off. And what are the Spurs got? LaMarcus Aldridge is coming off a bad season. Adavis Spurtans, a sophomore Point guard, DeJounte Murray, Patty Mills, um, old man, Mono Ginobili. I mean, look, the, the, everything begins and ends as of right now with Kawhi Leonard. So teams are going to be hungry for that and say, slow him down, get him under control, and you got a shot at beating the Spurs. So he's going to have to 
become a facilitator head into next season. I'm glad you I'm glad you agree with me with that. Let's talk actual point guards. Now we'll start with Tony Parker who has that torn quadricep muscle and we're assuming or I'm assuming that he's going to be back at some point in January, but even when he comes back, we saw his minutes and his play decline last year anyway. And now to come back from an injury that's going to keep him out of action for 7 to 8 months, he's not going to come back in and just play 25 a night cuz he probably wouldn't have even played 25 a night anyway given the way that mm-hmm. his minutes had started declining. So his role is going to be extremely limited this year if he actually even comes back on time. Like he might not be back till February. And I think you'll see him playing more of a mm-hmm. more of a 20-minute role for the majority of the regular season. Do you think that's a, a, a more accurate representation of what Parker's in store for this year? Who I think Parker might be in store for less minutes on the court as Popovich may preserve him for the postseason. Yep. They're, they're, they're not going to rush him back. He says in interviews overseas in France and even in Argentina that – He's back to running. He he's on his he's on two legs. He's not on crutches. He's uh, been filmed at basketball camps, you know, playing with kids uh, out in France, and he's dribbling the ball. He's not making any crazy pivots or playing full speed, but he looks like his recovery is well underway, and he's well on the path of uh, coming back. But he's not going to be the same Tony Parker, I believe, once he is up and ready to go. Popovich is simply going to play him maybe sparingly in the remaining months of the regular season. And then in that last month, say after the rodeo road trip, they, they're going to start increasing his uh, minutes and really test out that injury. And see if it really has um, come to fruition and healed up. Look, he's not going to get any preseason play. He's not going to be in training camp. And if he is in training camp, it's going to be light workouts and light scrimmages and maybe half court or one-on-one something, but he's not going to get game time simulation um, until the Spurs are ready for him to throw him out on the AT&T center and see what, how he's doing. It's almost sad. I mean, I look at him and I'm like, this, this is not how it should end. This is not, if this is going to be it for him and if he's not going to be the Tony Parker of old, you know, it hurts because he was one of the original big three. He was part of those Spurs championship run. And, uh, you know, just to see him go down the way he did last year in the postseason and, you know, speculation that it was career ending. And that's scary. That was so scary for me and for Spurs fans to see that happen to him. And think about it. He's the youngest of the original big three. And yet the oldest is still fighting away and still playing. I mean, it's amazing. But Parker, uh, I don't expect him to be Parker of old once he comes back. I'm expecting him. I think he's pretty I, – I, I don't know. And I don't know him. I don't have his cell phone number. I can't call him or text him. But I think he's pretty much resigned to the fact that, you know what, he's now going to be a backup point guard. And, yep. you know, even after this coming season and the few seasons ahead – that he may not be the starter anymore, that that's going to go to Murray or if they change something up and make some crazy trade uh, to get a quality point guard like they whiffed on uh, Chris Paul in the offseason. But uh, Parker is now going to become the mentor. He's he's changing his role. He's now going to be Mr. Miyagi. He is now going to be trying to teach the young kids, Murray, White, uh, what it is to run this Spurs team. And, hey, what better player to have on your side if you're an up-and-coming point guard like Murray uh, than Tony Parker, a guy who's won titles. He's Hall of Fame bound. He's done it all on the NBA level, the international level, the FIBA level. He's been playing since he was 19 years old and even younger professionally. So he's a wealth of knowledge, and Murray's going to tap into that. Parker will have the occasional outburst where we think that, oh, Tony Parker is back, but that's going to be few and far between. And Popovich is just really, really going to put the reins on him. He's not going to let him play 30, 40 minutes a game. 20 is good, like you mentioned, uh, 18. But I don't see anything more than 25. I think that's going to be pushing it, especially for a guy coming off an injury like he did. DeJounte Murray is probably going to start this season. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean that he's going to play starters minutes. I think that Mills is going to be the one pushing up to you know, high 20s, mm-hmm. low 30s in minutes, and Murray will play right. low 20s, unless something really changes. He struggled considerably. Uh, DeJounte Murray in summer league did not look great at all, and I don't think he's going to be an awesome fantasy option. Yeah, you can take a flyer with a last pick, and hopefully maybe he plays 26 a night, but I just, he's going to be that guy that we've seen so many times from Popovich that when Parker goes down, they just put in the third string point guard and let him start. And it used to be uh, Corey Joseph, and now now it's Dejounte Murray. And then let Parker 
or not Parker, that Mills come in as the backup and play the, the 28, 29 minutes. So I don't really love Murray as a pick. I think Mills is a good option. He's getting picked at pick 140. He's going to have that ability to increase his scoring. The assists, again, they're, they're not awesome from him, but I think that he can increase on that a little bit this year, get some steals and be a valuable late round sort of pick. But I don't really see much from Murray unless a huge amount changes in preseason for him to even push close to upper 20s in minutes. Yeah, look, the, the point guard position, in my opinion, is the weakest position for the Spurs heading into the next season. Parker, we know what happened to him. He's not going to be around for quite some time. You have a sophomore, DeJounte Murray, and there's you know the, the jury's still out on him. Coming, especially coming off uh, his performance in the summer league. It wasn't too uh, thrilling or promising. Look, the Spurs maybe, you know, inadvertently or maybe overtly are, are acknowledging that the point guard position is an issue. They took a, they reportedly took a chance on Chris Paul and, you know, apparently both sides were interested and well, that fell through. Then there was a rumblings that, Spurs and Kyrie Irving were linked, you know, during the Kyle Irving, Kyrie Irving wanting to leave a Cleveland uh, fiasco. Then there was rumblings of expert George Hill uh, and the Spurs being linked and him trying to make a return to where it all started for him. That fell through. So seemingly the Spurs are probably biting their fingernails right now thinking, holy, you know what? You can say holy shit. You can say holy shit on this podcast. That's good. Okay. Well, they're probably thinking, holy shit, we got to do something. And now you see them maybe trying to take a flyer on, like I mentioned, a London Perantes who they brought in. And, of course, they get Derek White. They're going to try to push Murray. And Mills is going to do what he can do. But you look at Mills. Yeah, you brought him up yeah, about him uh, rotating in quicker uh, for Murray. I go back to the fact that he is not – that facilitator he's he's more of a microwave if you will he's like finney johnson microwave. he needs to come off that man he needs to create his offense that's what the role he is he's not the type to come in and okay set up set up set up set up set up and he can do it but it's not his strong point but and then i and then we've talked about Kawhi leonard they're running uh the point for a while and that's good and all and that's great a point forward i mean it's not unheard of before in the nba history but you know you're i think you're taking away from a Kawhi leonard's uh you know, ability to really run more havoc, uh, you know, playing off the ball and, you know, playing off a point guard, picking rolls, you know, getting the pass. So this position is really, really, really in, you know, it's a head scratcher for me in the sense like, what are the Spurs going to do if Murray doesn't pan out? Yeah, what's going to happen? They're in trouble. You know? if, if, if they're in trouble. Out, they got, they're in they're in a lot of trouble. If Murray doesn't actually develop this year, like that, they are yeah. they are going to struggle, and that that's going to be a key part. Of, of how they look for this season. They do, as you touched on earlier, they do have Manu who, who is going to play his 19 minute role off the bench. He's going to distribute and him playing alongside Paddy Mills is awesome because Mills isn't that distributed, but Manu can be and and they those two work together. So you're going to get more of the same from Ginobili and he can be a fantasy asset as well because yeah, he can it, get three oh, or four sorry. assists a game pretty easily uh, in limited minutes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to uh, talk over you there, but you know, uh, I guess another kind of under the radar facilitator possibly is Kyle Anderson. Yes, yes, yeah. definitely. Uh, Anderson can I, handle the ball. He can play two, three, yeah. and four, and he is he is a really interesting player to me. If Rudy Gay wasn't around, I'd be really on to Kyle Anderson being this big breakout guy, getting 25, 26 mm-hmm. a night, handling the ball, getting steals, solid rebounder, hits some threes. Yeah, he's slow, but he does all these things really well. He's going to take on some of Jonathan Simmons' playing time, but I'm really interested mm-hmm. to see Anderson in his fourth year. And again, with that lack of ball handling, I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned him. I can see him, you know, taking a step forward. It's just going to require Popovich to trust him, which he has had issues with that uh, in the past. But I thought his play down the end of the season was uh, was really encouraging from Kyle Anderson. Yeah, I actually spent uh, considerable time with him and his camp uh, during the off season, and. Um, They've told me that one thing they worked with him uh, in the offseason is a uh, more body weight, more uh, becoming a stronger frame. And um, I got to see him play in a couple of uh, summer leagues, not not the Vegas or Orlando, but, you know, those ones in New York and you see in California. I saw one him play in a in New York City at the famed Dykeman Park. And right, my first impression when I saw him was like, he got bigger. Yep. He put on some muscle. 
So he his frame, he's definitely gotten stronger. Again, I spoke to his camp. One thing they did tell me uh, that they've been working on with him is repetition, repetitive, getting into that set, that shooting motion faster and quicker. I think they're trying to break away from the whole slow-mo uh, reputation. And he did tell me that um, – I'm sorry, not him, but his camp told me that they're also working on the point, uh, him handling the ball a little better. And so uh, it's it's looking good for uh, Kyle Anderson, hopefully. I mean, I had him last year as the breakout. It didn't pan out. Uh, this year, I'm not slotting him into the breakout uh, position uh, quite yet. But I see him being relied upon a little bit more. And I think it's now or never for him in silver and black. Uh, again, going back to his camp, I, they told me that they feel that he's been the forgotten spur um, since he's uh, joined San Antonio. Uh, they want to correct that. They want to fix that. They want to put him into the for or the front, the forefront uh, for the Spurs heading into next season. Uh, they're very, they were very positive with me. They liked what they saw as far as his offseason development. Uh, what I saw, at least physically, you know, he looks like he's improved in that department. Uh, also, I think uh, going back to the whole point guard position again, uh, another guy that the Spurs and this just tells you exactly how many guards they have on this roster is Bryn Forbes. Oh yeah, <laughs> I spoke to him during last season's regular season, and when he was playing in Austin quite a bit, and he told me that they, the Spurs, were telling him that he needs to learn the point guard position more than being the shooter that we know he can be. So don't be surprised if you see the Spurs go to him uh, a little bit often next season as far as running the team. He didn't... Um, in Vegas, though, he basically played off the ball the entire time. I thought they would have given him yeah. more of a run, but they played Murray and White as you know, strictly the point guards, mm -hmm. and, and Forbes just basically every time he got the ball shot it um, and didn't run anything for anyone else at any stage during Utah and Vegas Summer League. So that's that was a little bit surprising to me that they didn't get him at least to try and run things, but mm -hmm. they could be forced in, into giving him that role. Anderson, back to Anderson, um, if Gay is not healthy, like if Gay just isn't ready to go at the start of the season and he's just nowhere near as good as what he was and he can't handle minutes, then that's going to give Anderson a huge opportunity there as well to push and become maybe a 20-minute-a-game guy, maybe 23, 24 minutes. But it's going to be dependent on what Gay does. But he is a, a really interesting guy to have a look at. The other big name on this team, Jeff, is LaMarcus Aldridge, who people have been... Oh, yeah. I know in San Antonio, in Fantasyland, they've been disappointed with Aldridge since he joined mm -hmm. the San Antonio Spurs. He was always going to take a hit in his... Um, in his scoring numbers, but he's like had decreases across the board. He used to be a 20 and 10 guy. Now we're talking like 16 and seven, the rebounding drops, the scoring drop, the shot blocking's dropped. Um, everything seems to have dropped off for him and he's not young anymore. We're talking about a guy that's over 30. So expecting mm -hmm. him to get all of that back, I don't think that's happening. I think we, if we're seeing anything, we're seeing it go the other way now from Aldridge. But can you see a situation where he does improve from last season or is this just basically what we get from Aldridge now? Yeah, aside from when he's, uh, complaining about uh, not being happy. <laughs> I think this is what you're going to get. And I, and I don't think this is a situation because he's on some dramatic decline or anything. I just simply think it's, it's a combination of things. One, he's not the focal, focal point of this team. It's, it's Kawhi Leonard. Yep. You know, he he, frank, he practically was that until the emergence of uh, Damian Lillard in Portland. But yeah, and that's part of why he left. And that's part of why he left. Yeah, and that's exactly another reason why the rumors were rumbling again this offseason and why he wanted to leave and he wasn't happy in San Antonio. Uh, so you factor Kawhi Leonard being the established face of the team on both ends of the court. Okay, there's that. Okay, yeah, this is going to take a hit on LaMarcus Aldridge. But LaMarcus Aldridge is the two guy, at least of right now. And then you add in his age. He's getting up there. Then you well for NBA standards, you know he's still a young guy, but for NBA standards, that's already hit in the um, you know over the hill. Then you throw in this third, is that he you look at Lamarcus and he's also has to split time with a guy like Pal Gasol. You know you know Popovich loves the old guys. He's gonna you know run you roll with Pal Gasol and Pal Gasol at least last season. Hopefully he continue it was knocking down three point shots as if they were. 
layups for him. I mean, he was uh, on a plus 50% clip at one point in the uh, from beyond the arc last season. So then you got Pau Gasol, who just presents a different dimension than LaMarcus can. Okay, fine. So there's that. So you're looking at this this mixture coming together, and yeah, you can you can understand why LaMarcus had a dip in production since joining San Antonio. But if you really dig deep, Josh, his numbers still weren't horrendous at all. They weren't. I mean, look, he scored in double figures in 67 uh, of of the uh, games he played. He shot 41% from the three-point line. He had 18 double-doubles last year. That was a team best for San Antonio. He led the team in blocks with 88. Okay, he averaged in the regular season 17 points, seven rebounds, two assists, and a block. He shot 47%, and of course, I mentioned what he shot from beyond the arc, and he shot 81% from the free throw line, so he was pretty reliable in about 32 minutes. I think what magnified everything was what happened when Kawhi went down. The moment Kawhi went down in the postseason, everybody just looked at LaMarcus, and I mean everybody looked at LaMarcus as, okay, it's your time to shine. You don't have that excuse anymore of, well, I'm playing behind a star player, you know, Kawhi Leonard, similar to what happened in Portland, Damian Lillard. Uh, They're looking at him like, you don't have that anymore. You are now the man now. And that, I think that just wrecked everything. Uh, He didn't step up his points again. Yeah, they dipped from the regular season to the postseason, but not by much. Uh, he went from 17 in the regular season to s- close to 17, 16 and a half in the postseason. His rebounding's pretty much stayed the same, 7.4. His assists kind of stayed the same, 1.5. His block stayed about the same, 1. But again, they weren't those dominating LaMarcus Aldridge games that everyone saw from his time in Portland. And look, he probably had to adjust again to being the main guy. Uh, you, you, you know, when you have a big players that were bullying him in the paint and, you know, he's seemingly like getting pushed out as if like, hey, hey you know, like I'm bigger than Draymond uh, Green, but yet I can't shoot over him or I can't bully him back. You know, then you got that whole, is he soft? Uh, what's happened to him? Uh, there are even Spurs fans uh, were saying he's he's overweight, he's not, not in shape. It was just a, a perfect storm for him to look bad, and it happened. Uh, there were rumblings again, especially in the draft, that the Spurs were dangling him to move up in the draft. Of course, that spurred on, no, no pun intended, the, the rumors that he wanted out, the Spurs were done with him, that this experiment was over, it's not working out, but... Fast forward to today, he's still a silver and black. He's still under contract. And yeah, maybe no team wanted him because of that contract that he had. He's going to get paid a crazy amount of money next season. And then he has a player option for crazier money um, after next season. So they're just, it just, I think Spurs fans and NBA fans and LaMarcus Aldridge uh, naysayers and what have you, we're going to have to accept the fact that he's going to be a Spur. I don't think they're going to trade him. Uh, I don't think any team will probably want him as the way he's playing right now. Yeah, you heard Phoenix was interested in getting him. There was reports were shot down immediately that Portland wanted him back. That didn't not going to happen. Yeah, that's what yeah. So Lamarcus Aldridge is going to be a spur. I I think his uh, the like I mentioned a little while ago. I think it was just uh, a mixture of bad things coming together that worked against Lamarcus. Now, uh, you look at uh, next season. I think um, I think Spurs fans and NBA fans should simply just do this. Expect the result we got last year. Just expect that. Yeah. Don't get your hopes up high because then then you're gonna you're gonna get them dashed. I, so I think, expect the yeah. I think that the, yeah, what you said there is right. Look, you're just gonna get the same Aldridge. I think it's gonna be the same with a few other guys in this team. You're gonna have the same Manu Ginobili. Like, just expect mm-hmm. similar numbers. You're gonna have the same Danny Green as last season. Mm-hmm. Expect the same. You're gonna have the same Pau Gasol as last season. All this stuff. I think we expect similar numbers from those guys. One guy whose numbers I think are going to take a big increase, and that is a guy we referenced earlier, and that's Davis Bertans, who is going to have to step mm-hmm. into some of this role that was uh, vacated oh, yeah. by Lee and by Deadman. He came in, shot 40% from three in his first season here. He's been a a knockdown three-point shooter over in Europe. He can do more than just be a spot-up guy, though, and I think he's going to see his role increase yeah. significantly. He's going to be one of those players. And again, I talked about this on the Raptors podcast earlier. 
with Sean Woodley talking about, oh, DeMar DeRozan, you don't want him for fantasy because he's a shooting guard who doesn't hit threes. That's what people would say. That doesn't matter because I can get power forwards that give me one and a half to two threes a game. And Davis Bertans is going to be one of those guys that's going to hit one, even if he only scores, you know, 10 points a game, like probably six of those are going to be from three pointers. Like he can do that. He can do some stuff defensively. He's not a complete stiff. He can block some shots. He can get some steals. But uh, I guess that you're with me here that his role is going to be increased pretty significantly this season. Oh, yes. Uh, Davis Bertans, in, in the little uh, time that we saw him in the regular season and a little bit in the postseason, and we're going to see a lot of him in that Eurobasket 2017, he's going to – he's his his time is now, and I think the Spurs are going to rely on him. Yep. He, I, Heavy, he's, he's a regular part of the yeah. rotation now. He's a nightly part yeah. of it. Yes. And, and, and would you look at Davis, many people look at him and think he's a, as a shooter, and, yeah, he has one – sweet stroke and every time he lets that go it looks like it's gonna go down at the end of the uh, bucket and get three or two points on the scoreboard but he's more than that he is crazy athletic i don't i I think he's being underrated for how athletic he is he can get to the rim with ease and uh, flush it down with authority he can can be a disruptor on the defensive end. He's very long. He has long arms. He does. Um, keep in mind this. He's been playing at a professional level overseas since he was a kid. Very similar to what Tony Parker, when Parker was playing in 18, 19 years old overseas. He's been, he played against men twice his age, twice his size, and he has something that intangible that I like and that he is fiery and he's feisty. He's not afraid to get into a seasoned player's face, Greg Monroe or the Bucks. He is, I've seen him get, and I'm not promoting this, but I've seen him get into an all out brawl overseas and not back down from guys twice his size. I see, I saw him get in the face and in the body of, remember this guy? Uh, 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 oh, I forgot his name. A big, big Greek guy. He played in the NBA, started with an N. Um, Nurtix or something like that. Uh, but it, it was just some big burly guy and he was trying to back him down and get in his face. You fast forward to this, uh, this uh, season as it's off season, I'm sorry, in the exact exhibition games leading up to Eurobasket, He was so upset uh, at a, at an exhibition game where team Latvia just destroyed Czech Republic 103 to 69. I mean, just it waxed them in an, in a exhibition game. Yet afterwards, he was complaining about the refs and how they were not calling the calls right and how uh, they need the, the, this one particular ref needed to not even ref games anymore. I mean, he is all about winning, and that's what he is about. And, of course, later he did apologize for the comments he made towards uh, the European refs. But nonetheless, he is just – he's. I think he's ready. He's like that teapot. Or that on on the stove that's been boiling for a while, and you see it bubbling, and you see the teapot starting whistling. I think he, uh, he is ready to shine. I still think you gotta have Spurs fans, NBA fans are gonna have to have a little patience with him still. I think he's still in that development uh, stage as far as the NBA is concerned. But expect a spike in numbers, a spike in minutes, a spike in shooting percentages, uh, a spike in getting in players' faces if uh, they they try to get into his face or his teammates' face. I like the kid. I've liked him since the Spurs got his rights and the Kawhi Leonard draft day trade with George Hill. Um, I'm looking forward to great things for Davis Bertans. Would you say that he is your breakout candidate for this team? No. I still say I think I got to Tim Murray. Okay. I think so much is riding on his shoulders, and I think this is the pressure that he likes. Yep. And I think this is a it, he's going to want to come out and shine and prove – that he is the future of this San Antonio Spurs team. Look, we saw exactly the potential he could be last season. I don't know if you recall that winter game in Cleveland, overtime uh, win for San Antonio, where he single-handedly brought back the Spurs to the tie and then led them in the OT uh, win. I think... He is just on a mission, and he's been putting it out there that how determined he is. And yeah, there's something to say about determination and all, but at the end of the day, you got to bring it on the court. The Spurs are banking, they're investing on him, in him, I'm sorry, to be that next point guard. 
And yes, say what you will, maybe his shooting stroke needs some work. Uh, his finishing needs some work. But the guy has a wicked first step. He can break down defenses easily. And I think it's something that's going to be in the microscope for me, and I think it should be, and I think maybe was missed last year, was his defense. I think he played lanes pretty well. He, he has a long uh, wingspan. Uh, he has really natural instincts as a defensive disruptor, and I like what I saw that. Look, he's six foot five frame. He has a six foot nine and a half wingspan, and he can he can get lanes and tangle them up those passes and deflect them and pick them off. So I think he he's naturally instinctively a defensive player. It's just what you saw in Austin last year, although he put up crazy numbers at the end of the day, 25 plus points per game, 30 plus points per game. But you look at how many shots he took uh, was an issue. made you uh, scratch your head. Uh, he, he shot, I believe what 22.5% from the three point line in 64 combined games, whether it be in San Antonio or in Austin, not really good, but I think the Spurs are loading him up. I think they're giving him crash courses left and right and how to run the team. I think Tony Parker is in his ear. I think Patty Mills is going to be in his ear. I think Mono Ginobili is going to be in his ear. Uh, they're, they're really riding high on him, and he has to do it, and I think you're going to see that uh, heading into next season. So I have him penciled in as my breakout season, uh, player. But close, but a close second, a close second uh, was, is, was also either Rudy Gay or Davis Bertens. I think that uh, in terms of, uh, I think yeah, Murray's got that chance here. Anderson could be that guy as well. There's Bertens, yeah. there's a couple of guys. But in terms of value fantasy picks on this team, I think Paddy Mills probably leads it going where he's being drafted at pick 140. Yeah, Murray is definitely worth a fly with one of those last picks if he's around and you're looking for a point guard who's going to have that opportunity. But a lot of these other guys are just pretty solid where they are. As I said, Kawhi, he's ranked eighth. You pick him, mate. That's fine. Aldridge, Gasol, Green, all these guys are sort of right where they need to be. But as I touched on earlier, I think Rudy Gay is probably um, ranked a little bit too high. And, and Paul Gasol, I think he's right where he needs to be as well, right around that 100 mark. Um, he, he's going to get his boards. He's going to shoot some threes, probably not at 56% again. Um, but he'll he get, get his get some threes, get some blocks. He'll just sort of do what, what he needs to do. And hopefully he has an increase in his free throw percentage, which dropped off significantly last season. One last thing before we go, Jeff, get all the uh, guests to give us their... Thoughts on the over-unders that Vegas has released. Uh, the Spurs came out at 54.5. Uh, ESPN's Kevin Pelton projected the Spurs at 52.6. So do you go over-under on the 54.5 wins that uh, Vegas has put out? I'm going to go a little under. Uh, here's I, why. I will too. Yeah, and here's why. This is pretty much a brand new team. I mean, it almost is a brand new team. Uh, there's a lot of doubt and we mentioned about the point guard position. I think that's the biggest doubt right now. If you're a Spurs runner, NBA fan, or a fantasy player looking at this team and who to pick, and you're looking at who's the point guard, what happens if it doesn't work out? We talked about that. There's Rudy Gay. You know, you know, is he back? Is he? You know, you mentioned the history of players coming back from that type of injury. It's not that great. Kawhi Leonard. You know, it's he's almost. It's practically could be a possible one man show again next season. Lamarcus Aldridge. You know, will he bounce back or will he just be the same LMA? And we think there's going to be that. You bring in brand new parts, Derek White, uh, you, know, you know, who knows what kind of role he's going to have. Brent Forbes, Brendan Paul, Costello, Laverne, Rudy Gay. This is going to take time for this team to get uh, primed and ready to go. You add the fact that the West just got insanely strong. You, uh, you have... As I mentioned, Millsap coming over. You have Butler coming over to the West with Minnesota. Of course, the Warriors are the Warriors. You know, they're going to still, they're still the cream of the crop. Uh, you know, Chris Paul, you know, pairing up with James Harden. And the Spurs pretty much are a brand new team with players that didn't really make a big splash in the offseason aside maybe from Rudy Gay. They whiffed on Chris Paul. Nothing came to fruition about Kyrie Irving and the Spurs' uh, rumored interest in one another. They whiffed on George Hale, reportedly. They <laughs> re-signed Pau Gasol to a three-year deal, you know, an older player. Uh, yeah, yeah, he still has something left in the tank. Great, but it's still not that wow factor, or as they've been saying this offseason, that arms race. 
looks like instead of picking up a bazooka, they just ran on a bunch of firecrackers and maybe some watered down ones. You have Mono Ginobili who's back, which is great. It's awesome. It's amazing. But this is still not the Mono Ginobili of old. I'm a little worried about this team. I, I think they could, I could see them finishing third, you know, and, and overall when it's all said and done into postseason with Houston and maybe the Warriors ahead of them. But I'm still, at the end of the day, it comes down to one man. And he's that grumpy old man on the court, uh, the sidelines, and that's Popovich. And if anybody can pull a rabbit out of his hat, it would be Popovich. But you you look at this team overall, of course, you know, they, they lost arguably their second best player in the postseason, Tony Parker. You, you know, he's coming back um, later in the season. You know, how's that going to work out? 54.5 sounds reasonable, but I would slot them more 52, 53, something around there. The, it's going to take a while for this team to gel, to come together. Add the fact that the season starting earlier this year, so it's going to be kind of a rapid, you know, uh, you know, cl- classes in session for Popovich and his coaching staff for the new players. It's just so many questions surrounding this team um, outside of Kawhi Leonard. So, yeah, I say a little under. I, I think that should do it. Yeah, I would. Uh, I would take the under on that as well. Jeff, uh, let us know what's happening on Locked On Spurs and, and give us a plug and uh, give us your Twitter handle sure. and all that sort of stuff. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, if you want to discuss all things Spurs with me, email me at jeffgarcia74 at gmail.com. And of course, there is Locked On Spurs, as Josh mentioned. Uh, it's kind of quiet right now in the off season, so I'm um, doing my best to keep up with some news and notes. But once that regular season, preseason, training camp rolls around, or Locked On Spurs should be uh, ramping up. Uh, there's so much going on right now where I write at newsforcesanantonio.com and fox29sanantonio.com where I am the uh, the lead uh, Spurs beat writer for those two media outlets in San Antonio. Uh, we got it all covered, keeping you up to date with everything San Antonio in this uh, the doldrums of August. And I'm pretty sure, Josh, you're feeling my pain about this month. <laughs> There's really nothing going on. Now that Kyrie Irving in Boston is done, you know what else we're going to talk about? So... So much to looking forward to this Spurs season. Uh, fingers crossed. I think this team will be good, but will they be good enough to topple the Warriors or make it back to the NBA Finals and get that elusive six championship in franchise history? We shall see. So Lockdown Spurs, go check it out. Check out that. Check out this podcast, which you're already doing, but subscribe to it on Apple Podcasts, on Google Play, on TuneIn, on Stitcher, and on Spotify, and leave a review. A five-star review would be awesome. And another reminder that the Basketball Monster is open for the 2017-18 season, so uh, get your subscriptions. We are ready to go, and you can check out all the projections and uh, ask me questions about them, and we'll we'll go through any uh, queries you have about any of that stuff. Jeff, thank you for coming back on the show. Thank you, Josh. We are done here, everyone. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Patty Mills.